Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first webinar in our Hot Topics in Dementia Research webinar series. The first session today is on Lewy body disorders, the most common disease you've never heard of. My name is Carol Rogan, and I'm the coordinator of Dementia Research Network Ireland. So we're an interdisciplinary research network with clinicians, scientists, social researchers, government agencies, charity partners, and people living with dementia all working towards improving outcomes for people with dementia and neurodegeneration. And more information can be found on our website, which is dementia research network, sorry, dementia network.ie. So just a few things to mention before we get started. Uh, we're going to record today's session and uh, it'll be available on our YouTube channel after, uh, after today. Um, so we've uh, a number of great speakers lined up for you. So I'm just going to hand you over now to our first speaker, who is Kevin Quaid and his wife, Alina. And Kevin is a Limerick man and he is living with Lewy body disease. And he's going to talk about his personal experience of living with, with Lewy body. And his wife, Alina, is going to join him for the talk. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Um... I have five minutes, so I'm going to give you a kind of a whistle-stop tour of what it's like to have Lewy body dementia. And um, I suppose the first thing I need to say is I have it, but my wife lives with it. I am four, four and a half years into my diagnosis, a proper diagnosis, but I'm probably about eight years into my journey and I'm 58 years of age. So I would be classed as one of those people who has young onset dementia. And... Um, it was of such vital importance to me and to us as a family that I got a proper diagnosis. I was diagnosed first with Parkinson's disease and my neurologist wasn't happy. She knew there was something more wrong and she kept going and kept going with different scans and everything was turning up rosy. There was nothing alarming and the final scan she did was a DAT scan. It's capital D, small a, capital T. And she came back and she said that I was positive for Lewy body disease. Uh, Lewy body dementia. And I said, sure, I can't have dementia. I don't have memory problems. The only word I had that day was dementia. And there began a journey of discovery, a journey of meeting unique people. And it was like I had come to a crossroads in my life. I had been on construction and sales all my life and all that had to stop and I had to move in another direction. And I did and I found that I had a love of writing and it happened by pure accident because my neurologist, her team asked me to keep notes on what I was doing. And one day one of them suggested would I put them in the form of a book, which I did. And about three, three years ago, just over three years ago, I wrote a book called Louis Body Dementia Survival and Me. And at the time, a little country boy, or a big country boy from County Limerick, I discovered I was one of the first people in the world to write a book about Louis Body Dementia, as from the patient's point of view. And in it is just my life's my life story um, about being diagnosed, what it's like as a family. I have three children, three stepchildren. They wrote what it was like for them. Um, we made all the decisions about power of attorney and nursing homes and all that and my funeral and we've all them conversations got out of the way. It mightn't be for everyone, but that's what we did it. But in preparing for today, I look back over it and three years later, and some of the um, areas that I had put down that were a particular concern to me at the time were hip pain. What way is that now? It's not as bad. Blood vision, roughly around the same. Slow speech, my speech. I think has got a little bit better. I put down handwriting, but my stepdaughter pointed out to me, she said, Kevin, your handwriting was always bad, so you can't blame your body dementia for that. Uh, sudden sweating, that has improved. Confusion that I used to have, that has improved. The tremors I used to have, they have improved. When I'd be talking mid-sentence, sometimes I'd stop mid-sentence, that has improved. My appetite, even though it's hard to believe when you look at me, 
my appetite is not as big as it used to be. I kind of eat like a normal person now instead of like a gorilla. Loud noises I still hate. Uh, crowds I still hate. The verticalitis. I have some serious ball problems. I have some serious bladder problems. I actually go into hospital tomorrow and I go a couple of days each month for the next few months to get those sorted out. My asthma is not as bad as it was. My blood pressure is something the same. My energy levels would have dropped. So what I'm trying to say is just because you've been diagnosed, it's not the end of the world. And I found a passion and a passion for writing. And I found something that will stand to me and has stood to a lot of people that I've met along the way. Your brain is like any other muscle in your body. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. And if you will see the space around me here, this used to be part of a little workshop I had. Now I turned it into an office where my son and stepson did. And I, I put on my shirt and tie and I come to work and I do my writing. I write an article for a weekly newspaper. And I'm about to publish my second book and what you can achieve or what can be achieved. And just because you get a diagnosis of a disease that's progressive and incurable, I'm pleading with people, don't give up. Look for that thing that you always wanted to do or you have, would have liked to have done and chance it. Go for it. I know it's not going to be that way for everyone. Everyone is not going to be able to do it. And there is the initial shock of getting a diagnosis like I've got. But don't give up. Remember, it's this journey in life that's important, not the destination. And if any of you have any questions for me, stick them in the chat box. Um, I hope I can answer them after, and I hope I've given you a snapshot of what it's like to be to be Kevin Quaid. Thanks. My name is Helena. And uh, as Kevin's wife, I suppose, since Kevin's diagnosis, um, we have learned so much about this complex disease. And our lived experience can be very challenging at times. As Kevin's spousal carer, I have a bird's eye view of his vulnerability, his fears, which are both real and imaginary, his daily struggle with pain, which is really bad at times, fluctuations, REM sleep behaviour disorder and hallucinations. And it has been really over the passage of time that I can truly see the chronic nature of this disease. Um, Kevin has a great insight into this disease and he has the capacity to mask it really well at times. Uh, but in doing so, of course, it leaves him truly exhausted and weary. So if somebody calls and Kevin is actually up and not in bed, he will mask his symptoms very well. And then he's absolutely exhausted afterwards and has to go to bed. Also, he can mask it very well if somebody calls and I have said, oh, he's had a very bad night and he's not well. He will appear and put on an absolutely excellent show and can even make a liar out of me because I would have said, oh, he was very poor today or whatever. And he makes, he pushes himself a lot really to get to what he wants. Um, I suppose as a spousal carer, my world has become smaller because his world has become smaller. But I've come to appreciate the little things in life a lot more like meeting a friend in the park for coffee. And sometimes I really have to push myself to go for a chat. But after the chat and the laugh, I come away with a renewed feeling of normality. And I suppose as a carer 24 seven, we do need the break away. We do, we do need time out. Um, it's essential really for our health and well-being to get to that point where you can um, have a sit down with somebody. My family are wonderful. My sisters are fantastic. And it's just a break away. And with Kevin's LVD, there is actually always another bridge to cross with the nature of this disease. There really is. There's um, 
another challenge. This disease I find is hidden. It's unseen and seen at times. And when Kevin had to retire early from work, he was only 53, having been diagnosed at 51 with um, Parkinson's first. But when he uh, retired from work at 53, we said goodbye to our old normal. And, you know, five years on, we have actually transitioned to a new normal, whatever that term means now, because every day, it, I, it can be a different thing on any given day. And I found there is a thin line, line between staying positive and facing the realities of life. I would have to say, however, that um, I try to make the best of every day. And I know now my best is always good enough. And help is actually never far away because we do have a great family. Um, help is never far away if I have the courage and the humility to ask for it. Cheers. So thank you very much, Kevin and Helena, for a very, a very, I suppose, interesting insight into what it's like to live with Lewy body uh, disease and the challenges. And I suppose you also gave a message of hope there, uh, Kevin, in terms of you know the positive things that you're doing, the writing and the, the keeping active and keeping your brain healthy. So a very powerful message there. And Helena, in terms of, you know, your emphasis of the importance of looking after yourself as a carer, I think that's a, a very important message as well. So thank you very much to both of you for that. Um, so just to mention as well, if anyone has any questions or wants to make any comments, you can use the Q&A or chat functions, which are on your screen. And we'll have a 15 minute Q&A anyway at the end. And we might not be able to answer all questions, but we'll do our best. So I'd now like to pass you over to our next speaker, who's Professor Irisima Leroy. Um, Irisima is an associate, associate professor of geriatric psychiatry in Trinity College Dublin and St. James's Hospital. And she's going to talk about diagnosis, treatment and supports for Lewy body dementia. Thank you very much, Carol, and welcome to all of you. It's wonderful to have the opportunity to speak here. Um, I have 10 minutes and I'm just going to share my slides. Give me one moment. Forgive me, this is an updated version of Zoom. I don't know how to share my slides. Hang on a minute. There we go. I think we've got it. Yeah, we've got them there. Happy with that? Okay, fantastic. Okay, let's get cracking. Good. So, uh, what I've been asked to do today is address three questions in 10 minutes. So, <laughs> this is a, a huge challenge. So, what are the challenges in diagnosing Lewy body dementia, including reference to the international guidelines on diagnosing Lewy body? Is a DAT scan helpful in diagnosing Lewy body? And what treatments and supports are available? So to answer these questions, I'm going to refer you all to our Lewy Body Academy, which will be running in the next month, which will be taking place over a day and a half, because these are huge topics to talk about. So I'll just give a little bit of a snapshot, and I don't think I'll be able to get to the last question, but we'll do our best, give you a bit of a flavor. Now, many people on the call will, of course, be very familiar with DLB or Lewy body dementia or the various names it comes under. But just to remind people that sometimes it's helpful to talk about Lewy body spectrum disorders because, of course, this isn't one condition. This is a range of conditions, all with certain characteristics that are common to them. And these include idiopathic Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease with mild cognitive impairment or PDMCI, and then moving into the dementias, PDD or Parkinson's disease dementia, and DLB or dementia with Lewy bodies. These latter two constitute about 15% of all dementias. Now, sometimes in the clinic, we get into a little bit of a tussle because we're trying to get diagnostic accuracy. Is this PDD or is it DLB or is it something in between? And sometimes that isn't necessarily helpful. We can talk about the spectrum disorders and that our patient sits within the spectrum and that can be very helpful for people with the condition as well as their families. 
So Lewy body disorders, I think we can consider the chameleon of neurodegenerative disorders because it can present or they can present in so many different ways. And I'm going to touch on the clinical presentation in this next in the next bit. So why does it present in this in these various ways? And that's because the pathology is widespread. Now, in this cartoon, we can see the classic progression caudal to rostral of Lewy body pathology that we see in Parkinson's disease, which maps somewhat on with Lewy body dementia and Lewy body disease. But the really the point of this cartoon is to show that in this distribution of Lewy body pathology, we can have a significant variety of clinical syndromes and symptoms. So for example, if we have Lewy body pathology in the olfactory bulb, people present with anosmia or loss of smell, which can sometimes precede the onset of more obvious clinical symptoms by many years. Likewise, if we have pathology within the basal ganglia, we can see Parkinson's or the movement disorder. Moving up into the cortex, we start seeing cognitive disturbances and changes in personality, behavior, and motivation, and so on and so forth. So in this way, we can understand this panoply of symptoms. And again, in talking with patients and their families, it can be helpful to demonstrate this in, in a cartoon fashion to help them understand the wide variety of clinical presentations. And where the diagnostic challenges come in, I think particularly in Ireland, where we do not yet have linked up services for DLB or Lewy body spectrum disorders, is that people come into the medical services or the health services through different doors. So for example, you might walk into the psychiatry door because your predominant presentation is that of, vi of very stark visual hallucinations. By contrast, you might present with falls and syncope and autonomic dysfunction. So you might end up in the falls clinic or coming in through medicine of the elderly. You might also, like as Kevin described in his case, present with Parkinsonism and end up in neurology. Or you might even end up with a very acute syndrome of confusional state together with autonomic failure and end up in A&E. And therein lies the challenge, because, of course, often when people end up in a particular discipline or department, they may stay there and therefore not necessarily get the best care because they're not getting the inter interdisciplinary or the multidisciplinary input. So many of you will be familiar with the diagnostic criteria, but for those of you who are new to this, I'll just draw your attention to this particular paper, which talks about the diagnosis and management of dementia with Lewy bodies. And of course, here the photos of one of the most famous people who presented with Lewy, or rather presented with significant pathology in life, very sadly took his life, and only in pathology at, at post-mortem was it recognized that he had Lewy body pathology in his brain really stressing the idea that we have to try to pick up this disorder as early as possible, looking for the clinical manifestations wherever they present so that we can provide people with the best support and treatment. So very briefly touching on the diagnostic criteria, one of the key points that comes out of this, of course, is that DLB, that is the dementia form of this condition, and we're not talking about prodromal DLB today, but beware that those criteria do exist already. But DLB should be diagnosed when dementia occurs before or concurrently with Parkinsonism. Now, be careful because, of course, Parkinsonism does not occur in every person. And this is sometimes a trap that people fall into. When a person presents with a particular constellation of cognitive and emotional symptoms without Parkinsonism, they may be quick to dismiss DLB. But that isn't necessarily correct. So very briefly, probable or possible DLB can be diagnosed if you've got different combinations of core and supportive features, including the addition of biomarkers. And this is where the most recent clinical diagnostic criteria have progressed and advanced compared to previously, in that biomarkers are now included as part of the diagnosis or the diagnostic symptoms. The core clinical features include recurrent visual hallucinations, Parkinsonism generally includes bradykinesia, rest tremor or rigidity, fluctuating cognition, and REM sleep behavior disorder. Several of these, which of course Kevin mentioned for his own situation. Supportive clinical features include severe sensitivity to antipsychotic agents. And this of course is a huge challenge when people enter through the geriatric psychiatry door with only visual hallucinations. Then very often, the first treatment they get is antipsychotics, 
which is exactly the thing that they should not be getting because of severe sensitivity. Then, of course, autonomic nervous system difficulties with a range of different presentations. The indicative biomarkers here, first of all, reduced dopamine transporter uptake in the basal ganglia as demonstrated by spectral PET, then abnormal myosintigraphy, and then also polysomnographic confirmation of REM sleep without atonia. And there are a number of supported biomarkers as well, but these are less helpful in differentiating DLB from other um, forms of dementia. So the first bit I'm going to talk about here is the cognitive presentation and trying to tease out a person's cognitive impairment that presents due to DLB versus AD. The overall criteria for the clinical syndrome of dementia, of course, is defined in standard ways using the NIAA definitions, so that's not particularly helpful. But where we see the profile that is more specific to DLB is where we have less prominent and persistent memory impairment, but instead visual, spatial and executive dysfunction. And I'll just say a few more comments about these. So here's a typical example of various people with Lewy body dementia in different stages, just showing their attempts here at intersecting pentagons from the mini mental state exam. So you can see visual spatially, people are significantly challenged, and this can occur very early on when memory and orientation may still be quite intact. I'll draw your attention to this particular paper, which I found quite helpful, simply because it, it refers to the MOCA and trying to differentiate people's profile on the MOCA of those with DLB versus AD. And why this is helpful is because it's a widely used clinical tool that can even be applied in primary care. And so from this study, fairly si small sample size, people with DLB had lower performance in clock drawing. Again, that's well established. In other words, reflecting visual, spatial and executive function and higher performance in delayed recall versus people with Alzheimer's disease. And the conclusion from the paper was that this score pattern should raise suspicion for a DLB diagnosis at initial evaluation of people with dementia. Now, of course, this is less helpful if you have people presenting in different ways, such as initially with Parkinsonism or, for example, with psychosis. I'll just share a couple of slides on clock drawing because this is very common, a, a common way that we look at DLB compared to AD. And for a number of years, we've been saying that if you, if you apply a simple clock drawing test or the CDT, very often a person with Alzheimer's disease compared to a person with DLB will be able to copy the clock drawing equally. But when you ask them to freehand draw the clock, without copying, the person with DLB will score significantly worse. And where this is interesting, because of course the clock drawing evaluates a whole range of different neuropsychological aspects here, which I won't read them all out. But you can see from the illustration at the bottom, there's a number of different things that we can interpret. But really what's most valuable is the qualitative aspects of the interpretation. But because we've had this, this almost trope regarding clock drawing, it's quite interesting to take a look at a, a paper from 2015 by Tan and colleagues, in which they included 20 studies using clock drawings, comparing a range of different diagnoses for dementia of subtypes. And what was interesting from this analysis, none of the different diagnoses of dementia showed any difference in clock drawing performance, except for frontotemporal dementia. People with FDD scored consistently higher compared to people with AD. So DLB didn't come into the picture here. So that's just something to keep in mind. And I'll draw your attention to another helpful study, which I won't have time to go into in too much detail, but it's the study from 2020, um, which will be in the slides. Okay, I'm just gonna move on here. So what about Parkinsonism? If a person presents predominantly with Parkinsonism before the cognitive difficulties have been identified, because of course for the diagnosis they need to have been there already, they will likely to be more bradykinetic than having tremor dominant Parkinson's. Now often the Parkinsonism can be quite subtle and it may or not respond to dopamine replacement therapy. But the key point here is that not everybody presents with Parkinsonism. It is around 75 to 80% of people which means that if it's not there, do not be deceived, or if it is there, be careful of not going down the route of considering this as pure Parkinson's disease. 
REM sleep behavior disorder. This is where we get atonia during REM sleep or loss of atonia during REM sleep. In other words, people act out of their dreams in very vivid ways. So when they, they're dreaming about winning some kind of football game, they are kicking around and thrashing, and usually their bed partner is the person who suffers for this. REM sleep behavior disorder occurs in about 30% of people, but importantly, it can present many, many years before the onset of the rest of the clinical syndrome. So where it's not sensitive enough to be or rather it's not specific enough to be diagnostic in the early years, retrospectively, we can look back and we can see that people sometimes have complained of REM sleep behavior disorder for upwards of 20 years before the onset of the rest of the clinical syndrome. Fluctuating cognition and attention. This can cause significant diagnostic confusion, whereby people might be quite lucid and capable of performing tasks for hours or days at a time. But then also they can become extremely confused with garbled, with garbled speech, hallucinations, slowed movement, zoning out type presentations, high degrees of apathy, looking very different to the, the times when they are more lucid and capable. And sometimes this can fluctuate by minutes. So in other words, coming in and out of mini delirium. And this is where cholinesterase inhibitors can be particularly helpful in evening out that kind of fluctuation. What about visual hallucinations? Now, this is one of the core features that presents in the majority of people, upwards of 80%. They are very often complex, recurrent, maybe take the form of animals, children, people. Very often the person, excuse me, lacks insight and sometimes they can be quite frightening. And here we have to differentiate this from primary psychiatric disorders, from delirium, from space occupying lesions, other reversible causes of hallucinations in older people, including psychotic depression, but also syndromes such as Charles Bonnet. And again, where this becomes complex, if this is the predominant presentation, people tend to be prescribed antipsychotics, which of course is the thing exactly that we want to avoid. And instead, we want to be reaching for a cholinesterase inhibitor. So just to make a few more points about psychosis and neurodegenerative disease, in DLB, the hallucinations tend to be quite complex. And we also very often see misidentification delusions, which I'll mention in just a moment. In contrast, in Alzheimer's disease, moreover, we see people with paranoid ideas, often quite simple ideas. Somebody's stealing from me. Somebody's taking my things. They want to lock me up, but less often associated hallucinations. Just move on from this, other than really to point out in thinking about psychosis, and psychosis may be a misnomer when we talk about this, misidentifications of people, particularly people who are very close, can be very common. And this is in contrast to people with PDD, in which delusions or psychosis very often present with delusions of jealousy. In other words, the Othello syndrome, believing that their spouse or partner is being unfaithful to them. Delusions of misidentification occur in about a fifth of people. Um, could even be higher than that because very often people hide it or even care partners don't report on it because they find it so unusual or they think it's just part of a temporary confusion that the person may be experiencing. In my own clinic, I see this very frequently. And in fact, a couple of months ago, I had three patients in a row who presented with very stark misidentifications, leading to tremendous difficulty at home in the relationship with their care partner. So I won't go through detail of the types of Misidentifi misidentifications, but I guess the most frequent is that of the Capgras type in which the person believes that their loved one or their carer or somebody else in their sphere has been replaced by an imposter. And of course, this can lead to significant difficulties between the person and the recipient. And it presents as this person is not my husband, somebody is acting as my husband, there's a stranger living in my house, the person's been replaced by an imposter. Of course, Capgras syndrome is not unique or it's particular to a dementia with Lewy bodies. It can present in schizophrenia, delirium, psychotic depression, and other neurodegenerative disorders, adding to the diagnostic complexity. So again, it's about looking at the constellation of different symptoms and using the diagnostic criteria to understand where this fits. Now, just in the interest of time, I'll move on from this, but I just wanted to finish up here by drawing attention to the autonomic dysfunction that is extremely important and prevalent in 
Lewy body dementia and the Lewy body spectrum conditions, again, which often leads to diagnostic um, confusion. And very often people will present to Falls and Syncope clinics or to Med L clinics with various kinds of problems such as postural instability, repeated falls, syncope, or other transient episodes of unresponsiveness, sometimes leading to an A and E admission, and also severe autonomic dysfunction in the form of constipation orthostatic hypertension, urinary incontinence, and so forth, and sexual dysfunction. And it's these symptoms that significantly impact on people's quality of life. So important to recognize, important to attempt to address, and there's a range of different interventions that we can think about. And I'll draw people's attention, if you're not already aware, to the Diamond Louis uh, Toolkit, which looks at each of these different symptoms and syndromes within Louis body, and offer suggestions for management and treatment. And finally, part of my remit was, of course, to talk about DAT scans and can it be helpful diagnostically? And on the whole, yes. And I think here in Ireland, it's hugely underused and for, that's for a number of reasons and usually because of the long waiting list that we have and also the lack of recognition of the importance and need for DAT scans. And very often it can really clarify the diagnosis of whether this is DLB or a Lewy body spectrum condition versus Alzheimer's disease. And very broadly, what we see here is because of decreased presynaptic dopamine transporters, we can see the difference between a normal scan and an abnormal scan with regards to DLB, a normal scan presenting with commas. As you can see here in the first scan, in the uh, scan on the left and scan on the right is the abnormal where we see someone presenting with full stops. And this is something that can be really helpful to present to patients in the clinic when explaining why a DAT scan can be useful or talking about their results. However, keep in mind, this is not specific to DLB. And of course, we see it in other neurodegenerative disorders as well, but specifically not Alzheimer's disease. And I think I'm going to end there. Um, I'm not going to talk about myocardial scintigraphy, although important diagnostic biomarker and something that we need to increase the use of. Um, and I'm just going to spend the last couple of slides telling you some of the research initiatives that we are planning and we're currently doing, but there'll be more of this as the symposium goes on. The first one I wanted to mention is that we currently have fundings from the HRBT MRN to develop a core outcome set for DLB and PDD. In other words, trying to get commonality and understand from a variety of perspectives, including the literature, as well as the perspectives of professionals and people living with the condition, what outcomes are important for intervention studies. It's not good enough to simply adopt those from Alzheimer's studies or other uh, neurodegenerative disorders such as Parkinson's. We need to really understand what core outcome set is common to people with DLB, meaningful, and that can be used across all different studies. And that's an important piece of work that we are now halfway through. And I hope next year to be able to report back on that. Um, we are also starting Dementia Trials Ireland, which is an infrastructure network to raise the, the um, importance of dementia trials. And of course, the DLB research will be an important aspect of this. And finally, with multiple sites here in Dublin, and we hope to expand that, we are now members of the European DLB Consortium, in which we are collecting clinical data to contribute to a multi-nation uh, prospective data set so that we can understand the impact and also biomarkers within the spectrum disorders. And I'll end it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Leroy. That was a, a very interesting uh, presentation. I uh, was stop uh, to uh, have to pack it a lot there. So, uh, with the, uh, as I said earlier, the recording of today's webinar will be available on our YouTube channel later this week. So, for if you want to watch it back, they can do so. Um, so, now we're going to hand you over to our next speaker, who is Karen Meegan, who is co founder and director of the new Louis Body Ireland, and she's senior advisor fellow for FT Brain Health. Over to you, Hi, everybody. Good morning. And thank you, Carol, for the invitation here today. Um, I'm going to be very brief. So just to let you know, I am not a researcher. I'm not a clinician. Uh, I don't have Louis bodies and I'm not a care partner. So what's my role in Louis Body Ireland? Well, I suppose my main message is to collect the information from experts like uh, Irisima, 
and to share it with everybody in not just Ireland, but in the world. So it's a big ambition. So our mission is to make Ireland one of the centres of excellence uh, for Lewy body disease around the world. Uh, so that's a very bold claim. So how are we going to do it? Well, our first thing we're going to do is we're building a website right now. Um, but in the interim, we have a Twitter feed, which is at Lewy Body IRL. You're all welcome to join us and follow us there. So I know there was a few questions in the chat box about will we be able to see every seamless slides? Yes, of course. And um, the information is there. It's widely available if you know where to look. So now we're going to try and point you. Um, I feel my job is I'm a signpost. So if you can go on LinkedIn and follow me there, if you can go on Facebook and follow me there, and particularly on Twitter at Karen Meenan3, I'm going to put all that stuff in the chat box. Um, Irasima has done some amazing stuff. Uh, she's co-director as well in Louis Body Island on Capgras syndrome and on other parts of Louis Body disease. It's very complex, as you've probably guessed by now. Nuala, you put a comment in the chat box earlier about your dad, um, and you're wondering, because he scored well on memory tests and not so well on other tests. Is it Alzheimer's? I think maybe uh, a lot of those questions were answered in that 10 minute talk by Irisima. There are other webinars that have been filmed full hour long shows that you can see back on YouTube. Uh, again, if you want to listen back to any of those or all of those, uh, feel free to contact me. Um, info at louisbodyireland.org is where you'll find me. So um, I'm going to hand you on now. I just want to just make one more reference before we hand you on to Quiva, uh, who is one of our researchers. Um, we have a very informal chat once a month called Tea Time with Louis. We've deliberately kept it nice and informal. Uh, we have people who are joining us, not just we originally had planned it for people from Ireland to learn a little bit more. We estimate there's about 10,000 people in Ireland based on that it's the second most common form of dementia in Ireland that you've never heard of. Uh, so the 10,000 people in Ireland, we've now been joined by people from the UK, from Europe, from America, and now from Australia. So every third Thursday, you're welcome to join us. Our next one, the October one, is a special Australia uh, event. It's at 10 a.m. Again, follow us on Twitter. You'll get all the details. You'll get the links there. There's loads of information on, uh, we're working very closely with the Louis Body Society in the UK. Jackie Cannon is the CEO there. She's also a member of Louis Body Ireland. So if you follow the Louis Body Society in the UK, you'll get lots of information on their YouTube YouTube channel too. And also with LBDA, who are our partners in um, in America. Louis Body Australia, by the way, just to let you know the importance of Twitter and social media. They saw all the activity that we've been doing since about January, February, when we formed. And a couple of people there, Steve Coleman in particular, uh, who has Louis body disease, said, you know, how did you start? What did you get doing? And we just said, we just got a bunch of people together. And we started sharing information. So you've done the exact same thing, Louis body Australia. You're welcome to join us. 21st of October, it's at 10 a.m. So I'm going to hand you now to Quiva Tyndall, who is an amazing member of Louis body Ireland. And she's going to give you a little more information about the research. Great, thank you so much. And thank you, Carol, for inviting us. Let me share this now. Now, you can see this. I'm gonna assume you can see my screen. Yeah, that looks good, Quiva. Right. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. Um, so hello, my name is Quiva Tyndall, and I am a researcher in Trinity College Dublin in the Institute for Neuroscience. And I'll just go through a bit of the research that I do today. Um, so in my research, I'm investigating um, the development of a new cell model that we can use to sort of further understand the cellular and molecular um, mechanisms underlying Lewy body disorders and other diseases in which Lewy bodies um, are affected. And um, we're kind of trying to use this cell model in order to develop and test um, the efficacy of new treatment strategies or other interventions um, for Lewy body diseases. So uh, Lewy bodies are large clusters of damaged or misfolded proteins which form over time inside cells of the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system of people living with Lewy body diseases. And one of these damaged proteins, which makes up you know, a large component of Lewy bodies is called alpha synuclein. And if you were to zoom in and look at alpha synuclein um, in its natural unfolded state, it would look like this. 
And even though alpha-synuclein is a component of Lewy bodies, which we know to be quite toxic to the brain, alpha-synuclein in its unfolded state is actually not toxic at all. But unfortunately, this protein doesn't always exist in its unfolded non-toxic state. So under certain conditions, alpha-synuclein can become mutated. And when it gets mutated, it has the tendency to kind of clump together and fold into different shapes or conformations. So mutated alpha-synuclein monomers can clump together to form oligomers, protofibrils, fibrils, and eventually aggregate to the point where they become a major component of Lewy bodies. So the ability for alpha-synuclein to kind of undergo these, you know, sort of transient interactions, taking different forms in different environments, really does make synuclein the chameleon of the brain. So once these mutated forms of alpha-synuclein get inside the neuron, they can spread from cell to cell and all throughout the brain. And as more and more cells become disrupted by synuclein buildup, they can become damaged and eventually die. And when cells like neurons die as a result of synuclein buildup, they release these inflammatory molecules, which sort of signal to the rest of the brain to come and clear the debris of the dead or dying cell. And we can see sort of proof of these cells dying through the onset of symptoms associated with Lewy body diseases. So for example, symptoms of memory loss um, could be a result of damage or death to neurons in the part of the brain responsible for memory. But the purpose of my research is to find um, a way to target this cell death and try and stop it. But the tricky part is, is that by the time these Lewy bodies kind of deposit inside neurons, it's sometimes a bit uh, tricky to intervene. So instead of focusing my research on the Lewy bodies themselves, I'm focusing on its precursor, the alpha-synuclein fibril, in hopes of kind of intervening at an earlier stage uh, that this will help you know, sort of nail the target before the Lewy bodies come to form, and in doing so, um, prevent or at the very least try and control the cell death and the symptoms from getting out of hand. So the way that we think that alpha-synuclein fibrils are causing this cell death is through the process of neuroinflammation. And neuroinflammation involves another type of cell in the brain called a microglia. Uh, microglia are the immune cells of the brain, and just as immune cells around the rest of the body would, uh, microglia's job is to kind of survey the surrounding environment, um, and they do this with their long sort of ramifications, these big finger-like things, which kind of keep an eye out for pathogens that may have crossed into the brain or damaged material like debris from dead cells. So when microglia are sort of just monitoring the environment like this, they are um, basically kind of looking out for the bad guys. Uh, they're said to be in a resting state. But upon recognition of something foreign, like a dead cell, or an evading pathogen, or a mutated protein, like a fibril, for example, microglia can shift from this resting state into an activated state. And they retract their processes and they take this sort of balloon-like shape. And activated microglia can release what we call pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, which are just signaling molecules that signal to the rest of the brain to get rid of the pathogen and destroy it. And the thing about this is that they do this not only by destroying the pathogen, but also by destroying um, the cells that have been infected by these pathogens. So in trying to clear the brain of the pathogen, or in this case, the alpha-synuclein fibrils, these factors promote the death of infected cells. But as you've seen earlier, the cell death in and of itself further aggravates you know, microglial activators, and uh, this further promotes the release of neurotoxic, neurotoxic factors. So this sort of continuous cycle between inflammation and neurodegeneration shows this very toxic relationship that microglia, these guys, and neurons, these guys, can have in a brain that's overwhelmed by alpha-synuclein. So in our lab, we can try and recreate this relationship between neurons and microglia using a technique called cell culture. 
And we can use these cell cultures to um, test different treatment strategies for combating this synuclein-induced neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration. So using tissue from rat brains, and this is a rat brain, it's about the size of a grape, we can isolate um, microglia from this brain tissue and grow them in plastic plates. And this is what a microglia looks like under um, the microscope. You can see all those ramifications that I described earlier. Um, and when we manually induce their uh, activation, um, by, we can do this by just firing out a bunch of fibrils onto the plate, we can then collect these neurotoxic factors that they release and transfer them onto a plate of neurons that we've grown in the lab as well and see how the neurons react. So when we have this cell model perfected, we should be able to see the same neuronal damage here that we, you know, in the plate that we see in a Lewy body brain. And so at this point, having made um, what we call a representative model of, you know, at least one part of the Lewy body brain. We can look at ways to intervene and to calm the inflammation and to prevent microglial activation from becoming overactivated and in turn, um, you know, prevent the degeneration of neurons. So one way that we think that we can suppress chronic micro microglial activation is, uh, and, and this is based on studies that we've done in our lab and also based on um, a pile of literature that's been, um, you know, uh, published from other labs around the world, is by targeting a very specific receptor that's expressed on these microglial cells. And this is the beta-2 adrenal receptor. And we'd want to target this with a specific class of drugs, which is called the beta-2 adrenal receptor agonists. Um, and the mechanism through which this class of drugs um, sort of works results in having anti-inflammatory properties and as such um, has the capacity to kind of mediate the synuclein induced microglial activation and therefore keep the degeneration at bay. So um, now that I've showed you kind of uh, the idea uh, and the purpose of my research and, and the direction of my research and the setup of how I conduct my experiments, um, I look forward to kind of hopefully presenting to this group again to um, really show you some of the results that we find in the next couple of um, months as we conduct the experiments. So thank you for listening and uh, to Carol for inviting me to speak, and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, to the best of my ability. Thanks, Emil. Thanks very much, Quiva. And you, you made the, the hard science very uh, digestible. So that's, that's a great piece. So well done there. And as you say, it'd be nice to hear updates as your, your research progresses. So maybe you can organize follow up webinars to find out what's going on in your world of research. Um, so our last speaker is Ken Greeny, um, who is a carer for his father, who has Lewy Body Dementia and is co founder of Lewy Body Ireland. So I'll hand you over to you, Ken. Hello everyone, my name is Ken and my dad Dave is 69 and he has Lewy body dementia. In 2010 I noticed my dad had an absent arm swing, an unsteady gait and some REM sleep disorders. It took until 2017, seven years later, to get a confirmed diagnosis of Lewy body dementia. In 2009, my mom died tragically at the age of 53. As they were lowering my mom's coffin into the grave, I made a promise to her that my dad would never be alone. I was not to know, I suppose, how that single promise would change my life forever. Due to what I now know all these years later to be fluctuations associated with Lewy body disease, the doubts that affected me still haunt me to this day. The doubts I had of myself. Am I hearing what I heard? Did I see what I saw? Am I creating a narrative to fit my own opinion? The doubts of others, we didn't see dad do that. Are you sure there's something wrong with dad? And the doubts most cruelly that were on my dad himself. I suppose when a parent effectively becomes your child as a result of Louis bodies, it will change you forever. My dad's illness has affected all parts of his brain. His speech, his motor functions, his mobility, he has incontinence, he suffers from fear, anxiety, paranoia, persecutory hallucinations and delusions. 
I suppose the torture he endures due to the slow daily death he experiences, it will never ever leave my soul. In 2015, I met my now wife, Claire, whom I refer to as my earth angel. She offered me for the first time support when I needed it most, even though dad still didn't have a diagnosis at this stage. She gave it to me just at the right time. In 2018, I felt blessed for the second time in my life when dad got accepted into Carebright, the first ever home house dementia, dementia specific model of care in Ireland. For the first time in eight years, I felt that I could offer my dad a different level of care and support due to the wonderful love and compassion and kindness that Carebright afforded him. However, still no one knew how to treat my dad's Louis body dementia and the nightmare in his head continued. Through Carebright, I met Kevin and Alina who've spoken earlier and I suppose it was just in listening to their stories for the first time that I finally felt I wasn't going insane. But more importantly, my dad felt it too because he finally met somebody who understood him in Kevin. Louis Bodies, I suppose, as a carer for, your, for my father has taken so much away from me. But as I sit here today, you know, Louis Body Dementia has ultimately made me a better son, a better person, and a better human being. And I suppose this has brought me to where I am in front of you in the sense that I never want anyone to ever have to go through what me and my dad went through. I'm driven by pain and suffering, but I am motivated by hope and promise. And that hope for me is never more apparent than it is in the eyes of the people who've spoken here today. There's hope through Professor Leroy that through her understanding and awareness that she'll educate clinicians and professionals to be able to identify Lewy body disease far earlier so that family members and patients can receive the supports that they need at a time when they need it most. We have hope through Quiva that through her research that she can help us understand Louis bodies better and find cures and medicines for the future. We have hope through Karen as she expertly and efficiently collaborates and communicates with people all over the world to make Louis Body Ireland a center of excellence. And there's hope through Kevin and Alina that by sharing their lived experience that they too will change people's lives forever. Co-founding and setting up Louis Body Ireland has been the second greatest achievement of my life. The first greatest achievement being that I haven't broken that promise to my mom I met at her graveside. And to this day, my dad will never be alone. 2021 is my year of hope. As through the formation of Louis Body Ireland, I have met some of the most incredibly caring and selfless people ever. With a team of now over 20 people, I know that Louis Body Ireland, through the wonderful support from the Louis Body Society in the UK and the Louis Body Association in America, and also the collaboration with the Louis Body Australia, will continue to offer support, hope, and light to all the sons and daughters, wives and husbands and parents so that they will never have to feel alone now or in the future. So I thank you for your time. I'll hand you back to Karen now. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Ken, um, for a very inspirational talk there and a very personal, very touching uh, personal story that you shared with us, which isn't an easy thing to do on a public platform like this. So really appreciate that. And uh, similarly to Kevin and Alina who share their personal stories, it's, it's very powerful to, to hear those personal stories on a, a forum like this. So thank you.